so speak ye and so do as they that shall be judged by the law of liberty. Clarence Larkin was actually an Episcopalian, but in 1882, the same year that John Nelson Darby died, he converted to become a Baptist. And in fact, two years after his so-called conversion, he was ordained to be a Baptist pastor. It was during this time that he began to adopt and adhere to the tenets of dispensationalism, drawing and designing the dispensational charts. Then in 1918, he completed his work on dispensational truth. What's interesting about, about Clarence Larkin is, you know, he was an architect. And the Freemasons will use that phrase about God. And Clarence Larkin used a lot of terminology that actually aligns with the occult. He used a lot of symbolism and drawings that, that fall right in hand with what the Rosicrucians taught. Now, the Rosicrucians are a secret society inside of the Catholic Church. Rosicrucian simply means rosy cross. That was their symbol. And a lot of the occult teachings and drawings that he did, you can actually line it up hand, hand to hand with Hermes and the Kabbalah. There are several different traditions that refer to themselves as Kabbalah. And within each of this, there are different practices and techniques. First, the term Kabbalah refers to the esoteric or mystical aspect of Judaism. During the European Renaissance, concepts and methods from Jewish Kabbalah were adopted by some Christian scholars and integrated into their Christian theology, giving rise to what is called Christian Kabbalah. One thing that people don't understand about Clarence Larkin is that within his book, he lays a very solid foundation, not for biblical teaching, but rather for the New World Order. For example, in his book, The Dispensational Truth, on page 164, he has an entire section dedicated to expounding on the Great Pyramid. He's really got some fascinating stuff in there. In fact, he's got some work on the pyramids uh, that is often overlooked and that some people think is kind of kooky and might be kind of kooky, I don't know, but uh, uh, it is definitely worth considering and looking at and he comes at it from a logic uh, point of view, not a, not a, a biblical point of view. And in fact, he says here in Dispensational Teaching of the Great Pyramid, it was not built for a tomb, as were the others, but embodies in its construction such a wonderful knowledge of mathematics, astronomy, and scriptural information as to clearly show that the architect and builder was especially endowed with divine wisdom. Then he goes on to quote Job 38, verse 4 through 7, where it says, Where wast thou when I had laid the foundations of the earth? Declare if thou hast understanding. Who hath laid the measures thereof, if thou knowest? Or who hath stretched the line upon it? Whereupon are the foundations thereof fastened? Or who laid the cornerstone thereof when the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy? And when commenting on Job 38, he states this, The building referred to in the above passage must therefore be one with which Job was familiar. And to what can it better refer then to the great pyramid of which, as we shall see, Job was the probable builder. For what other form of building is there that has four foundation stones and a capstone or a head cornerstone, but a pyramid? So according to Clarence Larkin, he believes that the Great Pyramid is symbolic of what God was referring to in Job chapter 38. This Great Pyramid that is missing the capstone. Now keep in mind that Egypt has never been used in the Bible to symbolize anything godly. It's never been used to symbolize anything pure or holy. On the contrary, it's always been used to symbolize the world. It's always been used to symbolize paganism and idolatry. And yet Clarence Larkin in his book is associating a pagan structure in Egypt and relating it to Jesus Christ. He's using the Great Pyramid of Egypt and he's claiming that the capstone that's missing from the Great Pyramid of Egypt is in reference to Jesus Christ. He said, well, that's just a coincidence. You know, Clarence Larkin is just using capstone and cornerstone interchangeably. They mean the same thing, but they don't mean the same thing. You see, the cornerstone is at the foundation. The capstone is at the top. If you look at the back of an American dollar, you will see the Great Pyramid of Egypt on it. And right above it is a capstone with the Eye of Horus embedded in it. And what is the Eye of Horus? What's well, simply an occultic symbolic representation of Lucifer. You see, Jesus Christ is not the capstone according to the King James Bible. He's the cornerstone. Clarence Larkin's book is simply conditioning people for the New World Order. It's not a book to teach any biblical doctrine. It's a book to condition people for the New World Order. He says, listen, this is Clarence Larkin speaking. He says, they are not angels. Angels have bodies. 
He says, these are disembodied spirits. Clarence Larkin is teaching that a demon is a disembodied spirit. He's saying it was somebody that was once alive that is now in hell that can come back up as a spirit and possess other people. I, I disagree with a couple of things in, in his work, uh, just as I do Schofield's work. Both of them hold to a gap theory. Oh, there's a comma there. I'll bet you in between that comma, there was a judgment. There was a whole nother world that existed and all those people that God destroyed before Adam, they're now in hell and they come and go as they please because they're demons. This is what he taught. This is the doctrine of devils. Yeah. If you use this man's drawings or, or Schofield's notes as a crutch for your learning and understanding of the Word of God, then you will begin to doubt the things of God.